So this is, this is part three of the passions of the soul, and we've covered a lot of ground. We talked about the relationship between the mind and the body, which is mysterious and complicated, but Descartes has some sort of theory about that. And then we zoned in on passions. Passions are ways in which the, the brain and what's going on in the brain and how it's reacting to outside events and how it's taking positions is affecting the mind, what we actually perceive, what we sense in our consciousness. Then we talked about these six basic passions, and we spent a lot of time going over those and <coughs> what they are, how they work, you know, how, how love is different than desire, what wonder is, all of that. In this third part, Descartes is doing two things. He's talking about more specific passions that are, that are modalities or, or composites of these basic passions. And then he's wrapping everything up. And what I want to do at the start is begin with the wrap up because that gives you an idea of why he's talking about these, these particular things. So we, we touched on this at the end of last class session. The passions, there's a point to them. They, they help us to live the kind of lives for the kind of beings that we are. We are both mind and body. And we, we have to watch out for our bodies. Right? So, you know, you can't just eat anything and survive. Um, things that taste bad for you are generally bad for you. Although we live in a weird kind of wonderland now where um, all sorts of things that actually are bad for you taste wonderful because we've, we've you know, used the science of chemistry to make that so. But in general, things in the wild that taste awful, don't eat them. They're bad for you. Things that taste pretty good, usually pretty good for you. Um, those are modes of pleasure and pain. Those are modes of joy and sadness, Descartes would say. And things like love or hatred, um, those are centering on apprehensions that we have that things are beneficial for us or, or harmful for us. So um, we get mixed up about these things a lot, but in general, we, we hate the things that, that we at least perceive, whether they are truly or not, bad for us. And when something hurts us, then we, we begin to hate it. We desire to not have it by us. We have an aversion towards it. And when we have experiences and we like things, things feel good for us, they turn out well, we begin to love those things. Um, then there's wonder, and, and wonder helps us to you know, focus our attention on things. Um, and all of these can have problems with them. All of them can become excessive. But they're all, in some way, oriented towards um, good things for the body, soul composite, which is a human person. So Descartes doesn't want us not to have emotions. He doesn't want us to simply rein them in and get rid of them altogether. Um, it, at the very end of this part, he's talking about a general remedy for the passions. And remedy makes it sound like he's trying to get rid of them, right? When you have a remedy for a sickness, you're trying to get rid of it. So think about love. You know, would, would your life be better off? Just think about romantic love. People often make this kind of choice. Would your life be better off if you kept yourself from having any sort of romantic feelings for anybody? Because then you'll never get hurt, right? Don't people try to do that sometimes? Usually after a terrible breakup. Um, but yeah, we make movies about this sort of thing. If you were to do that, you'd deprive yourself of a great good, though. A good for the body and, the, and for the soul. Um, so he doesn't mean remedy in that sense. Think of it more like, imagine your, yourself as a diabetic. If you're a diabetic, what do you have to do? Do you have to just like stop eating sweet things altogether? I suppose if you're really, really badly off, maybe. But what do you have to do? Do any of you have relatives who are diabetic? Yeah, well, so what do you have to do? You have to like monitor your blood sugar. And uh, I mean, depending on what type you have, just watch your diet and exercise. And yeah. And you do have to take some medicine, right? The insulin. Yeah. Now, now you can take it all different ways. Um, but what you're talking about is even more important. Monitoring diet, exercise, having some sort of regimen in place. That's what he's talking about as a remedy for the passion. So he says, 
Now that we've met up with all the passions, we have much less reason for any anxiety about them than we had before. We're going to come back to that anxiety. We see that they're all intrinsically good. So hatred is good. Sadness is good, intrinsically, in itself. It doesn't feel good to be sad, right? It doesn't feel good to hate, but it's actually good for you in some, some respect because you, know, you should hate some things that are actually bad for you. You shouldn't like me poking you in the eye. You should hate that. You should hate me if I keep doing that. So he says, all we have to avoid is their misuse or their excess. And that's exactly what some sort of regimen for somebody who has an illness is trying to do. Avoid excess over here. Avoid too much of uh, being abstemious or ascetic as well. You know, It's not good for diabetics to starve themselves. Um, the remedies I have presented could be sufficient if everybody took the trouble to apply them. So we're going to look at those, those remedies. But the thing I want to focus on first, we have these passions, and the passions can cause us you know, pain and suffering. Some of them are by themselves painful to feel. Hatred, it's no fun. When you're angry, that doesn't feel good either, right? When you're sad, when your body doesn't feel feel good, um, that doesn't you know you don't enjoy that. I hope um, some people get into weird you know sort of feedback loops where they do, but, but usually that's because that makes them on some level happy. Um, now notice he talks about not pain and suffering here, but anxiety, or another word for that is fear, <coughs> blessing. <coughs> Our emotions are things that can cause us to feel other emotions. So, fear. Why, why should we feel fear with respect to our emotions? Because we know from experience they can lead us astray, right? Have you ever been afraid of your own anger? This happens to, to little children. Um, infants, actually. They, they, something happens, they get really upset. Suddenly, there's this kind of self-reflective moment, and they get scared of their own, their own anger. And that can happen to you as an adult. You do stupid things when you're angry, like you say terrible things to people, or you know, break things, or you know, destroy relationships by defriending them on Facebook, or things. <laughs> Watch them if you're going to do that. Probably a good idea. Um, that'd be the modern equivalent of it. Well, that that can make you afraid. Or have you ever been really happy? And yet you have this nagging feeling that, when's the other shoe going to fall? This is too good. Or, you know, you get sad and then you actually feel anxious about how sad you feel. And about how other people are going to take it. Or am I depressed? Or, you know, will I be able to function? Um, love and hate work that way, too. So, we don't actually have to have fear, which by itself is a passion, about our passions, if we adequately understand them. And then we put in place a kind of um, regime, a kind of diet. Diet, by the way, originally didn't just mean food. It meant a way of life. Um, that's the original sense of, of the, the term. Greek, Greek physicians wouldn't just tell you, hey, lose some weight, you know, quit eating so much. They would say, exercise. They would say, do this as well. Think about these things. So Descartes is, is giving you something like that. Interestingly enough, do you guys know what, what Descartes' uh, day job was? When he wasn't writing philosophy and doing experiments? Anybody know offhand? He had a degree in medicine. He was a doctor. He'd gone to medical school. He also had a law degree, too. He was kind of a hat trick guy, you know? So he says, um, how can we do this then? He says, hard work in advance is needed if we want to deal with our passions. Why do you have to do work in advance if you want to deal with your feelings? Yeah. So that you know what you can handle and what your limit is. That's an important part. Actually, self-knowledge about what anger looks like for you, what sadness looks like for you, what pain looks like for you. Um, how do you tell the difference between being joyful and being manic? You know. Um, so knowing your limitations, that's very important. Why else? Why, why else should you prepare in advance? What is it like when you feel something strongly? Is it easy to think about things, especially that feeling? Think about getting really angry. 
What happens to you when you get really angry, psychologically? Can't think straight. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a great anger management book, and the very first line of it says, as soon as you become angry, you become stupid. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are, you become stupid, and you become so stupid, you don't realize how stupid you are. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you're like, you know, stupid in the, in the sense like, you know, your brain is no longer working. Um, what it means is that you cease being rational. You cease attending to things that you should, you should pay attention to. And anger by itself, or, or, you know, sadness, or joy, they don't have a sort of self-governing mechanism. They can't tell you, hey, I, there's too much of me here. They usually say, let's have some more of me. So once you actually start feeling things, that's not the time to, to begin you know, doing your exercises. That's sort of like saying, um, you know, with respect to the actual physical exercise, um, you'll, uh, you'll start you know, benching 500. That's an awful lot of weight, but you know, Imagine that. Uh, I've seen people do it. It's quite amazing to watch. No, not 500, like, like 300, 400. Um, you're going to start doing that like that. You're going to walk into the gym and just head over there, start putting all those weights on, and just push it up. Um, that won't happen without a lot of exercise beforehand. Matter of fact, you know, one of the things that happens when you go into the gym for the first time is usually you put on too much weight, don't you? And then you're terribly sore the next day. <clears throat> it's the same thing with our emotions. He says, the objects of the passions arouse movements in the blood, remember he talks about blood, that, uh, fo that follow so fast from mere impressions in the brain and the disposition of the organs with no input from the soul that no amount of human wisdom could counteract those movements unless preparations have been made in advance. Now, we don't think that anger is about the blood anymore. We think it's about you know, electrical impulses and adrenaline and other hormones and things like that going through your body. Sadness is like that, too. Um, desire for food, for sex, for, for security, all these sorts of things. Uh, aversion, you know, our, our startle reaction. These things are all very powerful, and they happen so quickly. And they happen so automatically within the body, you know, happening in the brain, that oftentimes we can't think about them. We can't even tell, like when we get angry, we can't tell that we're already so angry. So we need to prepare in advance to be able to handle these things. Um, he says, one thing we can do is we can be on our guard and bear in mind that everything presented to the imagination tends to mislead the soul and make the reasons for pursuing the object of its passion appear much stronger than they are, and the reasons for not pursuing it much weaker. So again, with respect to anger, if you actually are armed ahead of time with this sort of thing, and you get angry, you can tell yourself, you know, generally when I get angry, I become kind of stupid and inattentive to everything other than what made me angry. And I tend to think that the things that I'm angry about really matter more than they do. And I tend to ignore the other things like relationships or not being a jerk or you know rules of fair play um, that, I, that I ought to be paying attention to. You can tell yourself that sort of thing. And <clears throat> it may or may not work. Right? Sometimes the anger still carries you away. Or when you get sad, you know, um, think about you know, I'm willing to bet that, that most of you have experienced a bad breakup romantically at one point or another at this stage in your life. And if not, you're, prob you're probably going to sooner or later. Um, unless you, you know, find the person for you and uh, you, you do it right off the bat or you just, you know, don't get involved with anybody ever. <coughs> What's it like when you have a bad breakup? Your, your feelings. What do they make you want to do? If you can't remember your experience of it, think about your friends or movies or things like that. What happens? Yeah. You get angry at the person, like you talk bad about them. Yeah, you tear up their pictures, get a scissors, snip, snip, here's your picture, throw theirs in the, the trash, talk bad about them. You want your friends to talk bad about them too, right? Um, so you bring everybody else in. What else? That, that's, a good, that's a good start. That's a big part of it. Anger. What else? I know Brooks likes to eat ice cream. 
Yeah. <laughs> and Jerry, help me out. Well, that's that's like a, a, a movie stereotype, right? So there's a breakup, and somebody's by the refrigerator, and they're eating it like right out of the, the gallon carton. Um, it's Brooks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So people have desire for for uh, food. There's actually a scientific basis they found for this. You know, fatty foods, sweet foods, salty foods. What are you gonna say? Are you gonna uh, turn the tables on him or? Uh, me? Yeah. I, I got him, gave him a foot in the bird. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah. not a hand up. Uh, yeah, no. People uh, drink a lot. Mm. Talk about drowning your sorrows, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, there's a desire for, for drink. Oftentimes people will, like, go out to the bar, not just because they want to get drunk, but because they actually want to be around other people who aren't that person who they're, they're upset with. Maybe they want them to commiserate. Um, there's a feeling of sadness too, right? Deep sadness. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, some people work out a lot. Work out a lot? Yeah, I think you're right. Um, there are some people who use that as the stress response to everything. Which, all things you know, considered, that's probably better than eating ice cream or getting really angry. You know, um, at least it doesn't doesn't screw up your body and you come out, you know, feeling a bit healthier. Um, now. What's going on there? You know, the, the feelings about the breakup, they're not, they're not governing themselves. They're, they're steering you towards certain things, having desires, loves, hates, anger, <clears throat> a few other different emotions. And they, they give you the impression that this is something I really ought to do. Like some people will reorganize their entire music collection. I really need to do this one thing. Or they paint their apartment, you know. They have to repaint everything, and they get really obsessive about getting the trim just right, or the colors just right. What's going on there? This is what Descartes is talking about. Um, reasons for pursuing the object of the passion appear much stronger than the eye. This is, this is part of what the passions do. And the reasons for not pursuing it become much weaker. So it, it screws up our sense of perspective, right? Um, if you become aware of that, again, you might be a little bit worried when you start realizing just how skewed your perspective is. So what Descartes actually advises too is another thing we can try to do when we're feeling strong passions is delay making any decisions about the things the passions are steering us towards. So you get into a really bad breakup, is that the time to jump into like a radically new project or get rid of all your clothes and buy new clothes and change who you are? Probably not. That's probably a bad idea. That's the feeling talking, not reason talking. And, you know, later on you come to regret it. Or think about um, rebound relationships. Right? What are rebound relationships? People have a bad breakup. They find somebody else. The main thing that that somebody else has is they're not this person over here. And how, how often do those rebound relationships work out? Not too often. Not, that's not a good basis for, for um, following your, you know, your desire for companionship, for sex, for, for you know, all the other things that come with relationships. So Descartes says, delay making any decision about the things that passion steer us towards, and think about other things. This sounds like stupid advice. Right? When you've gone through a bad breakup, <clears throat> somebody says, well, let's, let's do something else. Let's, let's play you know, video games, or let's go to the zoo, or... Let's uh, talk about some other topic when you actually want to talk about how awful that person is. Um, but that's actually good advice. Um, for anger, too. Anger management, they tell you, if you can keep your mind off of it for about 10 minutes and think about something else, you'll actually calm down. You'll feel less angry. Not just think less angry, you'll feel less angry in your body. Doesn't work, by the way, if, if you spend your time thinking about that person and how they made you angry or the things that they've done in the past. That's not going to work. Um, but if you can think about unicorns or ping pong balls or anything just trivial, any, anything stupid, for ten minutes, you'll actually start to feel better. Descartes onto something. So. Um, the other thing I want to point towards with this, so there's some, you know, like a diet with respect to the passions. He says, all the good of this life depends solely on the passions, and so does all the evil. That's a really interesting thing to say. 
all the good of this life. What does he mean by this life? Well, we are bodies united with souls. All the good that we can experience ultimately has to do with how we feel, not just how we think. So for the guy who said, you know, I think, therefore I am, he's, he's an awful lot about feelings, isn't he? He says, the pleasures that the, the soul shares with the body depend entirely on the passions. So that persons whom the passions can move most deeply are capable of enjoying the sweetest pleasures of this life. So Descartes is not saying you just want to, you know, mute the passions down. As a matter of fact, if you want to have the happiest life, you have to feel very deeply. Um, but you want them to be directed in the right ways, not, not going off, leading you into all sorts of crazy predicaments. He says there, there's a, a bad side to this. It's true they may also experience the most bitterness when they don't know how to put these passions to good use and when fortune works against them. Now, fortune, that's luck. You don't have any control over that. <clears throat> but you do have control over your passions. Not directly, but indirectly. By choosing to think about them the right way, to do the right things with them, to put in place kind of a, a, uh, uh, an exercise routine, you might, you might call it. So, all that said, let's look now at some of these specific passions <coughs> that Descartes focuses on. <coughs> Sorry. So, we talked last time about wonder. And Descartes says that this leads us to feeling some, some other things as well. And with wonder, we can feel esteem, or we can feel contempt. And esteem is when we view something as having high value. Contempt is when we view it as having low or no value. And, and this is relative, right? So it's not as if things just intrinsically possess the value they have. We give things value by the outlook that we, we have on them. And how do we measure value? There, there's some ways we, we do it quite easily. Think about this. The holiday season is coming up. You're going to be buying gifts. How are you going to get these gifts? What, what means of value are you going to exchange for the gifts? Money. money right. So money is one way we, we measure value. Um, let's take, uh, well, I, don't, I don't know anything about backpacks. I was going to say we could take backpacks, for instance. But I have no idea, looking down this row of backpacks, so nicely arranged, actually. I mean, look at it. It's like a perfect five in a row. Um, which of those is the most expensive? I have no idea. Um, which is the best backpack? I don't know. Which is, you know, which is the one that, that somebody uh, most ought to, to hold in high esteem? I don't know. Even when it comes to ties, I'm not a good judge of that. I leave that up to my, my wife to decide. <coughs> Books. I could tell you about books, which books are schlock and crap, and which books you ought to read, because they're valuable. Yeah? Aren't a lot of these things based on opinion? Yeah. And, and, yeah, valuation is very often opinion. It's a value judgment, we say. And I may value things differently than, than you do. Um, these are passions that are felt by people. And the passions that I feel are the passions I have. They may not be the ones that, that you have. Um, there are certain public ways in which we try to get on the same page. Like, you know, if I said to you, let's say you really like my tie, and it's like, I'll give this to you for a million dollars. You'd say, well, you're nuts, because I'm not going to give you even a hundred dollars for it. You know, I'll give you maybe ten dollars for it. And we, we're going back and forth. You know what that haggling process is? Is a convergence of opinion about value. And neither one of us is entirely happy, right? Because you actually think it should be over here, and I think it should be over here. But we do have some sort of standards, you know? 
Um, your entire curriculum that you're studying here at Marist is the product of a whole bunch of professors getting together years ago and hashing out over arguments with each other what you ought to be studying. Professors that may not even be here anymore decided this, this stuff for you, and you're kind of caught within that maze. Um, but that, that has to do with valuation. So we can, we can value things as highly, we can esteem them, or we can contemn them. We can also feel this about ourselves, can't we? We can think of ourselves as a, a person with high value, or we can look down upon ourselves. So, <clears throat> he says, these can relate to all sorts of objects. They're most conspicuous when we relate them to ourselves. So what is that when we relate them to ourselves? What can cause us to esteem ourselves? That's a good question. Do some people think too highly of themselves when they shouldn't, in your experience? Do some people think too lowly of themselves as well? You have a friend who's always tearing themselves down. You know they're a great person. They can't see that about themselves. So he talks about generosity. And he says, true generosity brings it about that a person's self-esteem is as great as it legitimately can be. Consists only in knowing that nothing truly belongs to the person except his free control over his will or her will. And that the good or bad use of this freedom is the only valid reason for him to be praised or blamed. Now think about all the different things we praise or blame people for. Blaming means criticizing. Um, all the things we vote people up on or vote people down on. So think about looks. You have some control over your looks, right? I mean, you can decide to take showers or not. Um, wash your hair, don't wash your hair. Uh, wear clothing that, that actually fits you. Uh, and looks good, you know, with your skin tone or, or not. Um, what else can you do? You can work out or not work out. Eat healthy or eat stuff that will give you, you know, all sorts of facial problems. Um, but a lot of that's out of your control, isn't it? How tall, you know, how tall you are. Do you have control over that? You know, shrink down. You're, you're too tall, like me, you know. It'd be, life would be more comfortable for you if you were, you know, about five foot ten. I mean, you, you know what it's like to try to pack yourself into car seats and, and on planes and things like that. Well, you don't have any control over it, do you? Um, those of you who are, who are shorter, get taller. Just make it happen. And you can say, well, I'll put on some platform shoes, or, but that's not really making you taller. You know, a lot of beauty is, is a matter of facial symmetry. You got the face you're, you're born with, and it's going to change over time, and you're kind of stuck with it. You're, by the way, as you get older, your ears are going to keep growing, your nose is going to keep growing. So if you're, if you're good looking now, you may not be as good looking 10 years from now or 20 years from now. If you're not good looking now, if your nose is too small, Maybe it's going to get bigger. You don't have control over that sort of thing. Um, it's not the sort of thing we should really esteem or contemn ourselves for. What about money? Having a lot of money. But, you know, that's a big one in our society. And we shouldn't feel bad about it being a big one in our society because it's a big one in every human society. Every human society has people who are valued solely on the basis of having wealth, usually on the basis of having inherited it, or you know, gotten it from, from somebody in some, some underhanded way. Um, that's not really something to, to esteem yourself for. If you're rich, that's good. That's fine. It's not to say you should try to be poor, because being poor by itself is not something good. You know, it's, it's kind of irrelevant. Having lots of friends. That gets a little bit closer. If you have a lot of friends because you just kiss everybody's rear end, um, that's probably not a good thing. If you have a lot of friends because they want to get something from you, probably not a good thing either, right? If you have a lot of friends because you have a genuinely good character and people see that and they want to hang out with you, that's probably a reflection of what he's talking about here with your will. You know, what you've chosen for yourself is your, your character. So this, this, this condition of generosity, which is, you know, sort of Descartes' key virtue, he says... Um, comes from knowing that nothing truly belongs to the person except for free control over their, their choices. 
and good or bad use of this, this freedom is the only valid reason for a person to be praised or blamed. That's the only thing that makes a person a good person or a bad person. Um, along with that, he says, this person's feeling within themselves a firm and constant resolution to use their freedom well, to use that, that human freedom that they have, never to lack the will to undertake and carry out whatever they judge to be best. Now notice what he says about this. If we actually have this kind of attitude, how are we going to behave towards other people? There's two ways you could go with this. You could be like, well, let's assume that I actually have this attitude, which I don't. Because, um, you know, it's kind of a high achievement. Um, I could say, well, you know, I actually value myself for the right reasons, and I have this firm resolution to do the right thing with my will. Um, looking at other people, they're not like that. So they're not good. Matter of fact, I should look down on them. Does that sound right to you? If I have this, this, this attitude that the only thing that's really good or bad about me is the choices that I make, the, the kind of person I choose to be, would it make sense for me to look down on everybody else? At first it might seem like that, right? Would it really make sense if you think it through? What's your feeling? Yeah. Uh, should we like respect other people? Yeah. Uh, now, he, he doesn't mean respect other people <clears throat> like in the sense of thinking that they're better than they are. They respect their ideas. You respect their potential. Um, they could be like that. Um, Descartes has this interesting attitude towards human beings. S somebody like Aristotle would say, <clears throat> if you're vicious, you're screwed. You, you've damaged yourself so much that you're probably not going to be able to get yourself out of it because you're, you're so screwed up that you think the way that you're behaving is the right way, and you know, what are you going to do with somebody like that? You know? um, Descartes would say, no, everybody, everybody can change. It's going to be tough, harder for some people to change than others. Like at your age, it's a lot easier for you to change than it is for somebody you know, my age. The dumb mistakes that I've made, uh, even ones when I was your age, about my character, are, they have a, you know, more weight to them. Um, you have a bit more control over that. But even, even I can change uh, if I want to, according to Descartes. So, so if I, but think about this. It, you know, you guys uh, all have characters that are fairly well established, but you have some control over at this point. What if I'm looking at little kids? You know, like, like five-year-olds, three-year-olds. Their characters, they show in certain respects. Some kids are bad kids, some kids are good kids. Some are, you know, nice, some are mean. But the, a lot could change, couldn't it? There's so much that could change. I could just look down on them and say, hey, they don't have anything established. But I recognize their potential. And, I, and in recognizing their potential as human beings, then I can value them. I can have what you call respect. Um, now, he also talks about humility. And he says the most generous people are also usually the humblest. Humble in what sense? We have humility as a virtue when by reflecting on the infirmity of our nature and the wrongs we may have done or could yet do, we don't rate ourselves higher than anyone else. And we think that since others have free will just as we do, they may, they may use it just as well as we use ours. So even if you're squared away, if you actually have this, this uh, condition of generosity, which Aristotle had a different word for, magnanimity. Um, you won't look down on others. You also won't push yourself up too high because you realize not only can others be doing the right thing, they have the potential for that, you have the potential for screwing up. If things didn't go a little bit differently for you, maybe you'd be more screwed up than you are now. You know, I, I remember just one case in point, um, <clears throat> there was a period where I was actually, when I was uh, 16 and 7, no, just 16 years old, I was a ward of the court because I was such a bad kid that my mom actually uh, filed what was called an uncontrollability petition saying, I can't do anything with this kid, let the state take him. And uh, I was a bad kid and, and actually deserved that. And like a lot of bad kids, I thought I wasn't a bad kid, you know. So 
I got thrown in with all these other bad kids in this this place. It was sort of like a holding tank, you know. Um, you weren't supposed to be there long term, but they want, they had to figure out where where to send you next. <coughs> so you know, juvenile detention or you know some sort of rehab place or things like that. And I got stuck there for like 21 days. So it, it wasn't really meant for that sort of thing. And I had you know all sorts of bad temper issues. Like that. So I was acting like a jerk, and I was pretty much a jerk nonstop anyway. And I had this guy who, who brought me into his office and sat me down. And, you know, he put up with quite a bit of my, my BS by that point. It was like four or five days in. And he said to me, look, I just want you to listen to this and, and just pay attention. Uh, don't take this personally. But you're, and he used a different word here. I'm just going to say jerk. You're really a jerk. And if you don't want people to treat you like a jerk, don't <coughs> act like a jerk. And for some reason, it was the right thing at the right time. It like made an impression on me, and I actually thought about it. And I thought, yeah, I actually, I better fix this. Um, now, if I hadn't had him coming along at that time, who knows how badly off I'd be? I'm still not, you know, where Descartes would want us to be. And if you think about these sorts of things. If you think about the fact that many of us had parents who we may not have liked, you know, as much as we could, but they were pretty good parents overall. We didn't have to have that. That didn't have to be the case for us. We had a lot of opportunities. Um, people have put up with a lot of our nonsense. That can humble you. That, that can be very helpful in introducing this, this uh, counter... Um, This counter virtue of humility. Um, so generosity means recognizing everything depends on, on you and your choices, and that other people are in that condition as well, and realizing that you could have screwed up those choices, and you can still screw up those choices. You can't just rest on your, on your laurels. <coughs> um, now, he, he opposes to this some other things. He says, what about people who are vain? Vanity. Um, it says, anyone who gets a good opinion of himself for any reason other than what we just talked about, you know, your choices, um, doesn't have true generosity, but a vanity that's always very far from virtue. The less justification they have for esteeming themselves highly, the greater the distance from virtue. The least justified is the person who is vain for no reason at all, not because he thinks he has some merit for which he should be appreciated. There are some people who think that they don't have anything going for them, but you should still like, you know, treat them with the utmost respect, that they're de totally deserving of it. They feel what we call entitled, right? <coughs> you guys all heard of the entitlement mentality? Um, everybody deserves a gold star just for walking in, that sort of mentality. That's actually vanity. That's not, that's not this, this uh, passion of generosity. It's not having a correct valuation of yourself. This goes to that, that question about opinion, right? Um, a person can have too high of an opinion of themselves that's not really based on anything. And unfortunately, you know, we live in a society like every other society that has ever existed and probably will exist where wealth, good looks, connections, um, position, what are other things that people pride themselves on? Um, who, they, who they're dating, who they're married to, uh, whether they have good taste in food and wine, um, what movies they're into, what music they're into, you go through all these sorts of things. People often rate themselves highly over these sort of things. But sports fans, gr great example. Sports allegiances are irrational. I, I, I love the Packers. I'm perfectly willing to say that my attachment to them, totally irrational. Packers fans are not better than Vikings fans as people, um, but I look down on Vikings fans. From a Cartesian perspective, that's totally stupid, right? If I were to actually like get into a fight with a Vikings fan at the game, uh, they have these things now, you know, Packers have the cheese head things, they have people wear a cheese grater now, you know? Uh, let's say I get into a fight with this guy. That would be insane. 
I'm holding myself to this super high value over something totally arbitrary. The other person is holding, I'm holding them to a low value over something equally arbitrary. That's vanity. Um, people who do this over clothes. Again, vanity. Or cars, another great example, right? How does your car look? What kind of car do you drive? That doesn't make you a good person or a bad person. Only your choices do. So vanity is, is very far from virtue. Um, would there be another thing that would be far from virtue that has to do with these kinds of valuations? Then? Jealousy? We're going to get to jealousy. Jealousy has to do with something a little bit different. In this range, so if you can value yourself too high, what's the opposite of that? Mm -hmm. Too low. And humility, sometimes when we're talking about humility, what we mean as a person is a, a real correct estimate of who they are and how easy it would be for them to be somebody different if they've made the wrong choices or that they could still make the wrong choices. That's not everybody's humility though, right? You also know the people who are always going around and woe is me, my life sucks so much, I'm nobody, I'm no good. That's also sort of like vanity only it's going in the other direction. He says, for someone to be abject or unvirtuously humble is chiefly for these things to be true of them. They have a feeling of weakness or indecision. They, they're unable to like commit to something. They can't help doing things that they know they'll be sorry about later on, as if they lacked full use of their will, and they believe they can't survive unaided or do without many things uh, whose acquisition depends on others. So he says this is directly opposed to generosity. It often happens the most abject people are the most arrogant and haughty. There's kind of a, a back and forth. If you're very humble like that and things go good for you, suddenly you become vain. Vain people, as soon as things, you know, the things that they have that um, they were, you know, vaunting themselves on go away, they suddenly become this unvirtuous, humble person because they don't have a correct estimate of what's really good and what's really bad. So think about somebody who's, who's prided themselves on their looks for a very long time. Take away their looks. Suddenly they feel like they're empty. They have nothing to offer. Probably they do have nothing to offer at that point in time because all they've done is based, you know, based on their looks. Um, could they change their life and you know, become a different person who actually does good things? Sure. A lot of times they don't, they just you know, go around self-pitying, right? And making themselves miserable and everybody else miserable. So, um, I'm going to skip over how he discusses ge how generosity is acquired. Let's move on and look at things like hope and, and anxiety. Um, this is a whole different modality of emotions. And these have to do mainly with desire, but they have to do with desire and our estimate of whether we can attain what it is that we want or, or not. And so what we have opposed here are hope and anxiety, or another word for that is fear. We have hope when we think there's a good chance that we can actually get what we desire. That's what it means to hope, right? We have fear when we think that it's uncertain or no chance or bad chance, little chance. And when these become very extreme, they can become what Descartes calls confidence. When you are pretty certain that you're going to get what it is that you want, you're, you're, you're confident. And despair is when you're pretty assured that you're just not going to get it. So, you know, think about right now going into finals week. Um, some classes, I'm willing to bet that for each of you, there is some class that you think you've got to lock, you've got an A in that class. How, you know, whatever may go on in the other classes, you're confident about that one. And then there's some where you feel some anxiety or some fear. There may actually be some where you're actually despairing, 
although that's probably not you, that's more likely the students that are not here and are going to show up on exam day and haven't been here for a while and just want to like see whether there's any possibility of pulling the, the, you know, the proverbial chestnuts out of the fire. Um, you guys are probably wavering between these two quite a bit. Um, same thing could go for job prospects. Something you don't have to worry about quite yet, thank, thank goodness. But you should start thinking about, you know, when you're going to start doing your internships and stuff like that. Right now, you probably have some degree of anxiety about the job market that you're eventually going out into. You'd be irrational not to. Um, you shouldn't feel despair about it. As a matter of fact, I think all of you should probably feel more hope than fear because you're smart, you apply yourselves, you're probably going to do okay. Probably. You know, it's not guaranteed. There's probably more reason for you to hope than to fear. Some of the other students who I've taught in my life probably had way too much hope. Like I, you know, I used to teach these students who were coming in with 800 SATs and they would tell me they were going to law school after they graduated. And I'd say, I don't think so. You know, they were confident about it because you know they had this unshaken thing. And what's going to happen to them is they'll they'll get you know finished, start applying, realize how hard the LSATs are, and then they'll feel despair. Um, but these are all modalities, and and these are very important. Now, getting to jealousy, what is what does Descartes say that jealousy is? Jealousy is a kind of anxiety having to do with our desire to keep possession of some good. So we could be jealous. We, what do we usually think about jealousy having to do with? What kind of good? Peanut butter cups? Not really. What do we? What do we usually? Yeah. Like other people, and their attention. Mm. Attention and one other thing that they they have to offer. Material thing. Um, we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's stick with the, the other people. So we have attention. I, you know, I give somebody attention. Somebody else would like that attention. What else, though? Affection. Affection. Very good. So when I am, if I'm, say, feeling jealousy with respect to my wife, uh, let's say my wife begins having an emotional affair, as we call it, you know, torrid internet uh, discussions through Gmail, you know, or Google Chat. With, with some some other guy, right? Now I become jealous. I'm becoming jealous about the fact that she is giving the attention and affection that I feel ought to belong to me to somebody else. Right? And does it always have to be the case that the person is actually doing that for somebody to feel jealous? No? Some people can feel jealousy over nothing. Isn't that, isn't that true? Have any of you ever had a, a overjealous uh, boyfriend or girlfriend? None of you? A few? Okay. See some nodding heads. What's that like? What goes on? In, what, 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 what can you, if you can see the gears in their head moving, what, what sort of things are happening? Yeah. It's just like a lot of fighting over like stupid stuff. That's the effect. Now, what, what's, what's the actual thought process? How does it sound? It's not good. That's a, that's that's correct as a value judgment. They're, they're like second guessing everything that they do and everything that you do and why like everything's happening. Yeah, you'll have some sort of like gesture. Yeah. You know, thinking you go to a restaurant, you the the waiter or waitress approaches, you thank them and you maintain eye contact because that's a nice thing to do, right? Treat a person like a person. You want to sleep with them, right? Now, how did you get from? Point A over here to point B over here. What kind of thought process was was required? Well, that's that's a good way to describe it. What is it? What does it actually sound? What are some sort of specifics? How do you get from thanks? It was a good dinner. To here, here's the here's the tip. You left too big of a tip. You want to sleep with them. Um, that's a big leap, isn't it? Really, like past experiences. Yeah, they, my, my previous boyfriend, girlfriend did this, and they, you know, X, Y, Z, so I know you're going to do the same thing. That's how people become jealous. 
yeah, I don't trust you, you know. Insecurities. Okay, yeah, you might be doing, people have this reasoning quite often going from might to are. You might be doing this, or this is a possibility, so I know that it's happening. Um, so all that can be wrapped up in this, this emotion of jealousy. And now it can also be about um, non-personal goods, too, material objects. You could be jealous, like, you know, again, we'll use this tie for an example. I could be jealous about this, this tie, I think, bless you. I irrationally believe that everybody else wants my tie. Because all of you, you know, say have a dad who you need to find a Christmas gift for. And, you know, if you stole my tie, because it's a nice tie, you could uh, check that one off your list. No, it's irrational thinking, right? Deeply irrational thinking. But I'm, I'm feeling, what's the passion? Fear about my ability to continue to keep a good that I want to keep. Descartes asks a really interesting question about this. Can jealousy be good? Are there cases where jealousy could be warranted, or is it always a bad thing to feel? Yeah. Does it mean good because it's a person that um, doesn't really care? I guess we'll understand. That's dangerous, but I, I see where, where you're going with that. Um, yeah, it does, it does convey caring. It could convey caring pathologically <laughs> in, in ways that are scary, but, but you're, you're right, yeah. There, I mean, there, if, if, for example, let me use my wife again. If I notice my wife, like, um, let's say I actually like, keep track of the finances, and I notice that there's all these hotel bills, or let's make it more tawdry, motel bills, and they like happen every you know, week when she's supposed to be teaching a class at night. And I, you know, I call up the motel and I say, I'm really, you know, curious about this sort of thing. Um, is my wife checking in there? I say, yeah, she's checking in with the same guy each week. Um, in that case, I probably should be jealous, right? And, and uh, maybe it does convey that I care about her to her if I, if I do that. Would be the word that. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think that maybe we're, we're moving into a different, different kind of emotion. Uh, yeah. But if you're jealous of like somebody else's accomplishments or something, and it could like make you aspire ah. to be like do good for yourself. Okay, so there we're talking about something that in our culture we often mistake for jealousy. Um, Descartes talks, and, and not just Descartes, but a lot of other ancient, medieval, modern theorists of emotion talk about two other emotions. Um, one is is envy. Envy is different than jealousy. Jealousy is where you want to hold on to the good that you have. Envy of another person's good is being unhappy that they, they have it and wanting it for yourself. So if you're, uh, well, I could be envious of all of your youth, for example, you know, because that's not going to, I'm not going to get that back, right? Um, and then I think it's a bad thing that, that you guys have, have, you know, the youth and vitality and good health that you do. That's not, that's not the same thing as being jealous. What you're talking about, though, isn't envy. There's a different word for it. It's called emulation. Emulation is where you feel a, a, a sense of pain in relation to another person who has some sort of good, but they deserve that good. And you wish that you had that for yourself. Usually it's in terms of, like, achievements, right? So, like, yeah. um, here would be a great example, again, with respect to romance. Bless you. Thank you. Let's say my relationship isn't that good, and I look at somebody else, and their marriage seems like it's perfect and all that, and I'm like, geez, why can't I get it together? <laughs> oh, oh, what the hell's that? <laughs> I didn't even know we had a phone in here. <laughs> all right, so uh, hopefully it won't ring again. Um, or what else, you know, like people's achievements in sports. You know, I... I will never be, in any sport that I watch, um, accomplished to the level of the people who I, I like to watch. Um, I wish I could be. That would be a good thing for me. But I recognize that it's a good for them, and I don't, I don't have any bad feelings towards them because of it. If I felt envy, I'd have bad feelings towards them. Um, if, if I actually had these, these skills, and I didn't want other people to acquire them, then I would be jealous of them. 
or I could be jealous of my, my reputation. So, so that, those are good, good distinctions to make. Um, Descartes says you could be jealous legitimately um, in a few cases. A captain defending a very important fortress has a right to be jealous of it. So you're assigned this task, hold this position, hold the line. You can feel a sense of jealousy. You don't want the enemy taking it from you. It's weird to call that jealousy, I think, um, but it does make sense. Um, a virtuous woman is not blamed for being jealous of her honor. What he's talking about there is there is this big emphasis on uh, preserving virginity until marriage, you know, uh, the, the, the euphemistic terms for that. But um, that's not something to be jealous. That, that's not something bad to be jealous about. To hold on to the, the capacities that you actually have, your skills, um, holding on to a position that you actually deserve. That, that's probably a good kind of jealousy. Um, so that's that. Let's talk about another thing. You talk about indecision. Indecision is a kind of anxiety. It says keeping the soul balanced between several actions open to us. Indecision causes it not to perform any of them. Have you ever been in a state like that? Where you can't, you can't decide and, and somebody else decides from the outside for you? Um, yeah, and he says this is, this is really bad when it goes on too long because it keeps us from, from acting when we should. Um, sometimes it could be good for us to be indecisive because it causes us to you know, stop for a minute, you know, not be too hasty, but in general it's a, it's a bad thing. Then he talks about um, courage and shrinking reluctance. I'm going to skip over those. Then he talks about some other really interesting things. Remember back when we talked about um, happiness in terms of Descartes and Princess Elizabeth. Descartes said that you could be happy provided you didn't feel certain emotions. One of those was remorse. So what is remorse? He says, remorse is a kind of sadness that comes from a doubt. A doubt about whether something we are doing or have done is good. This doubt is an essential feature of it. If we were quite sure that what we're doing is bad, we wouldn't do it. We, we do a lot of dumb things, things that actually turn out to be bad <coughs> for us or for other people um, because we don't think them through well enough. If we really knew that they were bad, we, we wouldn't choose to do them because part of recognizing something is bad is being averse to it, hating it. But there's a lot of things that we do and, and later on we're like, yeah, I'm not sure if that was the right thing to do. Maybe I shouldn't have told them this. Or maybe I, maybe I should have done this differently. Or maybe I should have made this choice. That's remorse. He says if we're certain what we have done, we've already done was bad, we would, we would have repentance over it. Sometimes we're just not sure, and we kind of like waver back and forth. That's a kind of sadness, but it's also a kind of anxiety. And if you've ever felt that, you know it sucks. It's, it's really painful. We often feel this with, with respect to relationships or opportunities. Um, so that, that's remorse. He also, a little bit later on, talks about another related one, repentance. <clears throat> he says, repentance is a kind of sadness which comes when we believe we've actually done something bad. We recognize our failings. We recognize that we did something that we shouldn't have done. And what makes it so bitter is that we realize it depends entirely on us. We could have chosen to do something differently. We didn't have to be a jerk. We didn't have to be selfish. We didn't have to um, be hasty. And you can go wrong with this. He talks about a weak-minded person repenting of something they've done without knowing for sure that it was bad. They persuade themselves that it was bad simply because they're afraid that it was. If they'd done the opposite thing, they'd be afraid that that was the wrong thing. Should I ask this person out or not ask them out? A very, you know, indecisive person can feel repentance over either, either choice. Should I take this job or not take this job? Again, you can feel repentance about, about either choice. Um, but if you're firm, you're only going to feel repentance if you've actually done something that you recognize as bad. Um, so that's another set of modalities. The last one that I want to talk about has to do with... Um, 
our attitudes towards other people doing things wrong. And Descartes makes a distinction that I think is very good for us to make. Indignation. Between indignation and anger. Two emotions that you're very familiar with because you felt them a lot, but they're often hard to distinguish from each other when you're feeling them. Um, so, what is indignation? He says, indignation is a kind of hatred or aversion that we naturally have towards those who do some evil, whatever it may be. So, think for example about people who um, recruit child soldiers. Uh, largely in Africa at this point, although it's happened in other places. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been going on for several generations now where they brutalize. First, they go into villages and they shoot a lot of the older people and they line up all the kids and they say, you, 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 you're now in the army, whatever the army happens to be. Usually it's a militia. And then they brutalize these kids. Just, you know, subject them to horrific abuse. And then they, they tell them, the abuse will stop if you want to be a soldier. And usually, being a soldier, uh, the way you get initiated is, is you kill somebody else. Start out by doing small stuff, killing some animals, then start killing people. And these are kids who are, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old. Um, similar things <coughs> like this happen with the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia. You can read Prince Sinowik's recounting of, of how these kids were, were turned into It's very difficult to come up with a better term than brutalized. Turned into to essentially something like army ants. Pure instinct. Pure hate. Um, now, when you hear about that sort of thing, if you have an emotional reaction of pity for those kids, that, that's good. But if you also have an emotional reaction of being feeling angry at those people who are doing that, that's not actually anger, that's actually indignation. You're not personally involved. I mean, you, you could be, I suppose, if you knew somebody who was a child soldier or something like that. But that's not the case for most of us. Indignation is when you feel a sense of hatred or aversion towards people who are doing bad things. Um, yeah, and he says, oftentimes it's mingled with envy or pity, but it has an object that's totally different from those, those two passions. We are indignant only towards those who do good or evil to people who don't deserve it. We envy those who receive this good, and we pity those who receive this evil. So this has to do with the agent, the person who's doing the things. We can be indignant about somebody who's doing something bad to somebody else because they don't deserve it. No child deserves that sort of brutalization. I don't care what the kid has done. Uh, nobody does. Um, you can think about child molesters, too. No child deserves to be molested. Um, believe it or not, there's, there's actually some philosophers, just goes to show you how people on the fringe can think, who, you know, came up with like theories of the child seducing the adult and all that. That's, that's sort of crazy. As a matter of fact, when you hear about that, you should probably be indignant with those people for suggesting that's the case, because they're kind of doing extra harm to the kids, aren't they? Um, so it can be about doing wrong that's not deserved. It can also be about giving some, somebody else goods that they don't deserve. Um, here's a great example. In our current um, criminal justice regime as a nation, and I understand there's, there's no one criminal justice system, it varies from state to state to state. Is there one form of crime that we probably have two strict sentences for? that pops up that you could think of in terms of the, the sort of damage that it does. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Um, we, send, we send a lot of people to, to medium security prisons on pretty small drug charges. I'm not talking about, you know, um, you know, big distributors or the enforcers or people like that. I'm talking about people selling small amounts of drugs who get, get caught with it and get pretty stiff sentences um, when you start comparing them to kidnapping, rape, murder, arson, you know, much more violent crimes. Um, does that bother you? 
If it does, that could be a matter of some sort of being indignant. And you could be indignant about the fact that in some cases, somebody might actually do a horrible crime and get out in five years um, because of the way the system works, while some other poor guy who, you know, got caught selling drugs when he was 18 years old, spends 20 years. Um, that would be a matter of being indignant. Again, you don't have to be, you don't have to be personally involved to be indignant. That's actually where the dividing line is between um, indignation and, and anger. And he says, oftentimes indignation is accompanied by wonder. You know, we're surprised that things are the, are the way they are. And he says, sometimes it's even in, uh, accompanied by joy. Now, do we ever go wrong with indignation? Do we ever get indignant about things we shouldn't? Sure. And he talks about that. He says it shows up much more in people who are, want to appear virtuous than those who really are. Um, some people become indignant about trivial matters. Some people get indignant about matters for which no one can be blamed. Um, so those are, those are you know, abuses. What about anger itself? He says anger is a hatred or aversion we have towards those who have done or tried to do harm, not just to someone, but to us in particular. Now, does it have to be us individually, or it could be people connected with us? We can get angry on behalf of people that are connected with us. So I, I talk about your friend, or your, your boyfriend or girlfriend, or your, your you know, who's, who's the parent you should probably never talk trash about? Mom. Mom, right. Dad, eh, dad can take care of himself. Don't talk about people's moms, right? That sets people off. Why? Because they, they identify those people with themselves. Remember what we talked about is love? When you love somebody, you have this sort of imagining themselves, imagining them to be part of a greater whole that includes you and that person as a part. So if you have feelings of love towards somebody and somebody else is, is making fun of them, hurting them, you're going to get angry at that person just as you would if they did those sort of things to you, perhaps even more so. Um, so he says, anger is based on an action that affects us and for which we have a desire to avenge ourselves. That's the central desire of anger, revenge. Um, he says, anger is, is the most violent of the emotions because the desire to ward off harmful things and to avenge oneself is the most compelling of all desires. That's an interesting thing to think about. Do you think that's, that's true? Do you think that anger is the strongest of the emotions, or do you think that one of the other emotions is, is a, a stronger emotion for, for most people? Like love, perhaps, or joy, or sadness. Descartes thinks that anger is the one that's the strongest. Um, and he says there's two kinds of anger. There's anger that sort of comes out right away. He says, um, Flares up suddenly, it's obvious from the outside, but has little effect and can easily be calmed. And the kind of people who get angry like this, he says, are those who don't have deep hatred, but they have an instant aversion that takes them by surprise. Um, they tend to imagine everything ought to happen in the way they think best. So when it doesn't happen, they wonder at it and they take offense. Um, they, they, they get upset. You know some people like that, right? They, they're not angry people per se, but they're easy to, to anger. But once they get angry, they don't stay that angry. The more dangerous kind of anger, he says, is less obvious, but it gnaws more at the heart and has effects that are more dangerous. What happens with this kind of anger, he says, hatred and sadness predominate. This is the kind of anger that actually makes people angry, very often in passive-aggressive, hidden ways, vengeful people. He says, the wrongs that arouse somebody's anger appear greater in proportion as vanity increases their self-esteem, also in proportion to their valuation of the good things these wrongs take away. So when people have these things mixed up in their head, when, they, when they're wrong with other passions, they're liable to this more noxious, poisonous kind of anger that can stay within a person and become a lasting disposition, affecting their entire life, their relationships their views on themselves. Um, I think that you can see a lot of people exemplifying both kinds of anger in our, in our society. Um, perhaps you've felt 
both of those. Um, the last thing I'm going to touch on, uh, he talks about vainglory and shame. And we're, we're almost done. Um, vainglory is when somebody thinks too highly of themselves. Um, and we've talked about this already. And it, it has to do with the hope of being praised by others. You know, there's some people who sort of only exist in other people's mm -hmm. estimation. They are their Facebook profile, so to speak. You know people like that? Um, how many likes they get that day, you know, their mood depends on that. <laughs> shame is the opposite of that. Shame is a kind of sadness also based on self-love, which also comes from expecting people to, to blame you or criticize you. And it's different than, than modesty or, or humility. Um, these, are, these are emotions that we would want to try to eliminate. So what Descartes has given us here, to sum, sum up, is sort of a road map for the emotions. If we understand the emotions, then we can begin to actually start to take steps to control them, to channel them in the right directions, to question ourselves when we're feeling them. Um, and then we can live a better life, he thinks.